Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Davenport, I'm the University Librarian, and I am pleased to welcome you all today to this conversation that Derek Jefferson is going to lead us through on Boys in the Hood. Um, in his regular day job here in the library, as some of uh, we have some colleagues and, and some um, non-library people here. So in his regular day job, he's the communications librarian for the School of Communications, known as an embedded library, meaning that's the, that's the part of the university that he serves most deeply and works very closely with those faculty members. But any student that walks in um, often seeks out Derek's help as well. He came to AU in 2013. Um, time goes fast, doesn't it? Um, so he's now in his fourth year here. Uh, and brings to us a wealth of experience. Um, he majored in creative writing as an undergraduate at San Diego State University and then moved on to the graduate film program at the Art Center College of Design before then getting a second master's degree in library and information sciences from Louisiana State University. In between that academic, various academic pursuits, he operated in the film industry in Los Angeles had a stint as a food photographer, and worked as a journalist. Um, he's also done a lot of public service, including, because he was in Louisiana for his graduate program, a lot of work in public libraries, literally restoring them after Katrina, um, when it wasn't just the books. It was taking care of the carpeting. It was getting the mold off the walls. It was everything that happened during that um, terrible event. Only as a side note would I say that the very first conference to go into New Orleans after Katrina, when they, many associations canceled and canceled and canceled, the very first group to go was the American Library Association that then did also an awful lot of public service um, in the community as, well, we were there as conference attendees. We were also the same ones who went to Canada during SARS. Um, so it, it's a rather brave profession. <laughs> Welcome to the microphone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, you know, I hadn't watched the movie in a long time, and I watched it again last night. I started watching it last week and couldn't because I was super busy with work stuff. We are at a university. And I watched it again last night, and I was so, it like it all came back to me, you know? Are, are we all familiar with the film? You've seen the film? And I remember when this film came out, in 1991, it came out about a month after I graduated from high school. And so it was so, it was this kind of seminal period of, of like transition in my life. And I think why the movie spoke to me so deeply, and I remember, like, you know, I'll, I'll go back a little further than that. So I distinctly remember seeing Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing mm -hmm. in uh, 1989 with my little crew of friends, my little click of fellow African Americans, youths, and I was 16, and I remember walking out of that theater feeling so tense and so riled up. And this movie takes place on the hottest day of the year in Brooklyn, and things kind of escalate, and it's hot, and the color palette is super saturated, and, uh, you know, and it gets to build to this kind of denouement of you know, the trash can being thrown and the police coming in and the inevitable death of Radio Rahim. And I just remember walking out of that theater feeling so angry. But at the same time, you know, and there's this kind of this genre, subgenre of what they call these hood films, of which Boys in the Hood is one of. Um, but at the same time, it felt really kind of distant to me because I grew up in Southern California. My dad was um, retired from the Navy and started working for the National Park Service. Uh, my mother was an administrator that worked in special education for San Diego City Schools, in San Diego, Navy town. And um, while I could certainly identify with what it felt to be a young African-American male, um, there was this kind of arm's length distance because, you know, we didn't live in brownstones and we had freeways and we drove everywhere. I lived, you know, 15 minutes from the U.S.-Mexico border. It just was a different place in time. Um, so 
two years later, John Singleton, who I believe was 23 at the time that this film was produced, and which he wrote and directed as a student at USC, um, came out, it really resonated because not only did I see people who kind of like looked like me, the experiences in that film were very similar to people I knew. I knew a Doughboy, I knew a Ricky, I knew a Trey. Um, and so it really um, was this kind of like, it was like holding up a mirror to my own life. Um, so, I have always been a film lover. <clears throat> It didn't seem practical to me to become a filmmaker or to study film. It just wasn't something that people like me did. Um, but I always, you know, really kind of enjoyed the cinema. And so one of the reasons I think that this film is so kind of impactful to me and, you know, it's one of these films that we say changed America is not only because its depiction of African-American youth in Los Angeles, but the depiction of African-American youth in Los Angeles by another African-American youth from Los Angeles. So it wasn't just the depiction, it was also that the man who wrote the script and behind the camera was someone that I could identify with, who looked like me and lived like me. Um, so in the summer of 91, we have, uh, we have New Jack City, which, you know, we want to call these, these kind of hood films. We have Boys in the Hood. And we have uh, Straight Out of Brooklyn by Maddie Rich. And I remember seeing these films over and over and over again, kind of indulgently, because it was my kind of respite. It was my, it was something that gave me a lot of pleasure. It was something that, about these films, specifically boys, because it was something that I could relate to. Um, San Diego, I think to many people, is this kind of Shangri-La. You know, people think, the military and palm trees and the beaches, which are certainly accurate. I mean, I lived there for almost 28 years, I think, before I moved to Los Angeles to go study film. Um, but I also remember distinctly in high school, I remember the influx of uh, crack cocaine, of gang members, and kind of this gang life that had kind of trickled down from Los Angeles. I remember even I grew up, you know, in this kind of working class, middle class neighborhood. I remember, you know, leaving school on Friday and coming back to school on Monday over the weekend with classmates who hadn't survived the weekend, <clears throat> which is a lot to deal with and to put on a person and to have to have to have these kinds of expectations. Um, and these are things that we see depicted in the film. Um, I looked up the notion of urban because we kind of connotate these films. You know, some people say hood films, black films, black filmmakers, urban films. And so I looked up, again, the librarian in me, uh, looked up urban on the Oxford English Dictionary, which is kind of our de facto uh, source. So one of the, uh, and this is in sequence, the definition relating to, situated, or occurring in, or characteristic of a town or city, especially as opposed to the countryside. Okay, that sounds about right. Uh, that constitute or includes part of a town or city. Okay, that sounds accurate. Of or relating to any of the variety of genres of popular music of a type chiefly associated with black performers designating this type of music. I have to go back and look at the dates and see when these were instituted because that's a little bit of a, hmm, interesting. And then after that, uh, especially a fashion characteristic of or relating to the subculture associated with this type of music, 
also of or relating to black, especially African American, popular or youth culture generally. Okay? And then the next definition after that, a person who belongs to or lives in a town or city. <laughs> I just think that's, uh, that's very interesting, especially in the context of the film. Um, you know, the film to me is about a lot of things. Um, one of the things that really stands out to me is, is the notion of kind of what it's like, you know, leaving boyhood behind and growing up and becoming a man. And that's certainly in the context of fatherhood. Uh, Larry Fishburne, as he was known then, plays Furious Styles, which is the best name. That's like straight out of the Toni Morrison novel. Like Furious Styles is, and he's got the, the, the balls that he, you know, ruminates and stresses out over as Trey is running around. Um, parenting, one of the things I think that really stands out in relation to fatherhood is that we see Trey, whose mother is played by the inimitable Angela Bassett, who after an incident with Trey in school, who kind of acts out, says, you know, I can't teach this boy how to be a man. I have to send him to his father and let his father raise him to be a man. I'm losing him. And in the context of what it is to be a young African-American man in the context of South Central Los Angeles in these times, she doesn't want, it's, 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 it's gonna be gangs, it's gonna be drugs, it's gonna be jail or a combination of both. And so she, she has instituted Furious, who I, I, don't, I don't think it's ever stated, but I don't believe they were ever married in the film, to kind of take ownership of his son and raise him to become a man. Um, and you can kind of juxtapose this with his friends when he moves in with his father. Uh, the Ricky and Doughboy, who are brothers with separate fathers, um, who are, are absent in these families. And at one point, Furious says, you know, I'm raising you to be a man. And, you know, your friends across the street don't have that. And you're going to see, and it's prophetic, but, you know, you're going to see how they turn out, which I think is... An interesting, uh, interesting line um, in the city, in, in the movie. Um, there's this this presence of black on black crime in the film, which it's interesting. This movie's twenty. I can't believe it's twenty five years old because that means I'm twenty five years older. <laughs> um, you know, but these things that were addressed in the film, and even and I will say this with the casting of Ice Cube as Doughboy in the film, this kind of further notion of things that he depicted as a member of N.W.A. talking about police brutality, um, what it's like to be a person of color, a young man growing up in these um, areas where the, you know, systemically things are kind of stacked against you. Um, we see drugs, Doughboy is a, is a drug dealer in the film. Um, I'm also thinking in the context of kind of depictions of Los Angeles as someone who was a former Los Angeles resident. Um, you know, the depiction of the film as seen through kind of John Singleton's lens as the writer and director, you know, contrast that with something like Crash, which came out a number of years later, directed uh, by Paul Haggis, or the film uh, Grand Canyon. I don't know if you're familiar with Grand Canyon, but uh, I think that's Lawrence Kasdan that directed that. Um, an interesting kind of depiction of Los Angeles, um, very different kind of purview. I mean, we can go into, I think, 93, we have the Hughes Brothers Menace to Society comes out, which in some of, and I'm kind of doing my research as a librarian, you know, people say, you know, Menace to Society came out and it made Boys in the Hood look like a Disney film. Um, which is interesting because, and I like both films, but certainly, you know, Boys in the Hood was certainly much more kind of similar to my own experience growing up, which I think is why it resonated, so. Um, Another thing that I think is uh, really interesting is that you have Ice Cube in his first kind of major role. And it's funny now because you see him doing like the barbershop movies and are we there yet? He's kind of comic. Um, and again, almost kind of hood-esque. There's certainly kind of um, African-American casts and are probably likely promoted and kind of focused on an African-American audience. But to see him be this kind of really surly, snarling, you know, rapper that has transitioned into acting. This was his first major role. Um, 
And along those lines, we see a lot of faces in that film who have gone on to become big stars. Cuba Gooding Jr., who recently had a lot of press because of the uh, American crime story, the O.J. Simpson uh, miniseries. Uh, Angela Bassett, who uh, doesn't seem to age at all. I wish I could find out what she's doing. I need a little bit of that. Um, Morris Chestnut, I believe that was his very first film. Um, again, Larry Fishburne, who I'm using my film scholar knowledge now, was also in Apocalypse Now. That was his first film as a teen. Um, now Lawrence Fishburne. Um, Regina King, who I think is great. We've seen her in a lot of stuff since then, but uh, her character Aisha, who might be an alcoholic in the film. I'm not, it's never really kind of overtly said, but you know, she certainly has her issues, but also is funny. She has her, her kind of pithy lines that comes in and kind of cuts Doughboy down from time to time. Um, but again, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the notion of um, looking at this film through these, again, these 25 years, I can't believe that it's been that long. Um, because things have changed. Like I think about one of the reasons why this film is so impactful to me is that it gave me kind of the license to say, you can study film. You can be great in film. You can do these things that you don't think are necessarily available to you or accessible to you. And I certainly think that at that time in my life, you know, graduating high school, going to college, I was always, a, I read a lot, you know? I, I, I like writing a lot. Um, I don't know, I guess, as many people who kind of live this kind of liberal arts life, thought about what you could actually do with that, you know, once you kind of graduated and moved forward, other than just kind of be smart and pithy at dinner parties, I guess. Um, but it just wasn't something that, you know, people that I grew up with did. And so the impact of that film was so significant for me because it gave me the license to say, you know, you can be more than you think you can. So I'll never, I will always kind of be eternally grateful for John Singleton and for Boys in the Hood for kind of giving me the ability to see that in myself. Um, one of the things, and this is, um, and you see this a lot with kind of hood films, is soundtracks. You know, the music, that a lot of times they will cast rappers. Ice-T, I believe, is in New Jack City. We have Ice Cube here. Straight Outta Brooklyn was a small indie film out of New York, and I can't <coughs> think of anyone associated with that. But then you have, you know, most in any of all the Spike Lee films, you know, great soundtracks. Uh, Trespass was another kind of film that came out in that era. You know, again, soundtracks. Um, but one of the things that Ice Cube did for the soundtrack of Borders and Hood was a song called How to Survive in South Central, which again, 25 years later, is still so prescient and so um, relevant in the age of everything that's going on right now, Baltimore, uh, Ferguson, uh, Sandra Bland, the things that we're seeing um, day in and day out in the media, in this kind of real-time social media, 24-hour cable news cycle. I'm going to quote um, a, a couple of the lines that I think are really relevant. Again, this is 1991, the summer when this song comes out. Uh, and he's talking about basically how to survive in South Central. Uh, now, if you're white, you can trust the police. But if you're black, they ain't nothing but beasts. Watch out for the kill. Don't make a false move and keep your hands on the steering wheel. And don't get smart. Answer all questions. And that's the first lesson on staying alive. In South Central, yeah, that's how you survive. And to see that 25 years ago, and to be 18 and 19 years old, and kind of knowing that intrinsically, you know, having gotten the talk, you know, we hear a lot about that in the context of what it is to be African American in this um, OED defined sense of urban life. And that 25 years later, even probably even more so, and I don't know if it's the advent of social media, again, the 24-hour news cycle, that we see this really in real time. Um, 
were so many other points. So I was, um, you know, the movie itself is a really simple story. It's about, you know, this young man kind of transitioning into adulthood in contrast with his friends who have a different life uh, kind of sort of growing up from him. Um, there's one point I think that's really kind of notable in the film towards the end um, as it's kind of rising to its denouement where Ricky and Doughboy, who are brothers, are fighting in the front yard. Uh, Ricky is asked by his live-in girlfriend and the mother of his child to go get some cornmeal. I can't finish frying this fish until you go get this cornmeal. And he comes out and tells Doughboy, who is the drug dealer and has a car, um, and it's his brother, half-brother. She wants you to go get the cornmeal, go to the store and get this cornmeal. And he doesn't. Um, and they start kind of scrapping about it in the front yard. And Trey intervenes at one point. I think this is really interesting that John Singleton does this as the writer and the director, is that Trey breaks up the fight and says, y'all are brothers, you ain't supposed to be fighting. Which I think resonates on the fact that they're physically blood brothers. But it's also saying to African-American men, you know, we got to stop this black on black crime. We got to stop killing each other. You have to remember at this point, and I remember 1988, 89, um, again, with the advent of crack cocaine in, the, in these kind of inner city settings um, that really kind of fueled these, the growth of gangs, street gangs, Crips and the Bloods most notably. Um, and in hindsight, and I guess even then, it just felt so surreal that people would kind of claim ownership of a neighborhood and it became their territory. Um, and I remember being 16 and 17 and you know maybe even 18 years old, hanging out as we did in front of our houses. I was the one house on the block that had a basketball hoop on the garage door, so everyone would come over to my house and play basketball, um, especially in the, the long, hot days of the summer. And as the evenings grew on and the night got dark, you know, any time a car turned onto our block, you know, that we would kind of crouch down, we would get behind things, we would kind of protect ourselves because you didn't know if it was going to be your next door neighbor or someone with the beef or someone with the gun or all of these things or none of these things. And it's interesting now that it became so kind of second nature to us that's, that we had to deal with that. It's crazy. But, you know, self-preservation is a hell of a thing. Um, my other notes. Again, I think it was also interesting in that a lot of my kind of impressions of depictions of African Americans on film, again, Spike Lee was kind of the, you know, black filmmaker du jour at the time. Everything was this kind of East Coast slant. So we saw things through this kind of East Coast lens. And um, again, Boys in the Hood was the first to really, again, you know, like, you know, you saw the palm trees, you saw the blue skies, which is, again, it's kind of uh, seductive in a way. I, as someone who lives in DC now, certainly think about that when winter strikes and <laughs> I'm stuck here with, um, you know, the two inches of snow that can make DC crawl, <laughs> come to a crawl. Um, so I, I'm curious about what it's like. Again, this was like my livelihood. This was my experience. This is something that I recognize. And so I'm, I'm always, always curious about what it's like for people that aren't from Southern California and how it resonated for them, how it spoke to them. Um, as someone who was always kind of creative and liked movies and liked stories and writing, um, you know, I, like, I just like a good story. I like a good film. And so the fact that on top of that, Again, I knew a Ricky, I knew a Doughboy, I knew an Aisha. Um, you know, I might have even been a little bit of Doughboy. I might have been a little bit of Trey. Probably more Trey than Doughboy, but there you go. Um, it's a very, very powerful, distinct film that, um, again, really has impacted me in such a, a strong, strong way. And I mean, the first one, the movie is a total classic. I mean, it is a movie I can watch over and over and over mm -hmm. again and analyze one. 
and his movie Baby Boy, mm -hmm. which I thought was fantastic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like a like a a follow up. It's almost like part two of that story. It didn't play, and yet it was a right. really phenomenal movie. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the fact that there were so many people discovered out. Mm -hmm. so the, the cast is incredible. Incredible. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting to me, there's a lot of things interesting to me, but one of the things for me to watch was to see the adolescent, the black adolescent life in Crenshaw with the cars that hopped mm -hmm. up. The, the lowriders, yeah. I didn't know anything right. about and it was fascinating to see this is how the adolescents spent their time with these souped up cars. Sure. And the other thing was was the feeling of the value that the gangs had of somebody's life that's just young and starting out, and it was a no fault that you could just end somebody's life so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's just an incredible movie. Again, and look at say Ricky, and I think about you know his senseless death that comes at the end of the film, and I go back to why it happened. So they're on Crenshaw, which back in the day on Sundays, you would hit up Crenshaw in your low rider, your fancy car, and you would just hang out. And I think, you know, we certainly see that that's not something that is um, distinct of African American culture. You know, kids like to hang out. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, we see this again, and um, there's a scene in Do the Right Thing. I can't think of what the guy's name is, but someone steps on his Air Jordan and smudges it. His brand new $100 Air Jordans, which, like, you could die over. It's something as, as simple as the smudging of a shoe. And so, in Boys in the Hood, it's just like they kind of brusquely pass each other and his shoulder gets kind of knocked in again. And somehow that's some demeaning, disrespectful um, event that through a chain of events, leads to the death of Ricky, who was this promising football player, who, as he is leaving to go get the cornmeal for his living girlfriend and mother of his child, um, interesting enough, John Singleton plays the postman in a Hitchcockian role. Uh, his little cameo delivers his test scores. He needs a 700 on his SATs. And, you know, his mom says, Ricky, your scores, your scores, your scores, and he's just in his head. And he's with Trey going to the store to get the cornmeal. And, you know, the people that he, the knuckle, I'll say the knuckleheads that he bumped into that night on Crenshaw see him in an alley. And the inevitable happens. And it's it's literally it's something is well, I'll, I'll just say it's meaningless as a shoulder nudge or, you know, someone smudging your sneaker. Um, and so what is it? Again, this kind of devaluing of lives, it's kind of diminishing of the role of that people have, certainly specifically young black men. So it, does, it, still, it still resonates. I've had um, you know, meetings here with my supervisors that have been great. And, you know, and I, you know, I'm very busy as a librarian. I work very hard. I love my job. Um, you know, but sometimes it's hard when you have the news. And again, I work with the School of Communications. I'm a former journalist. I, yeah, I'm in D.C. I feel like it's my kind of job to stay on top of the media coverage and the news. But it's tough when it seems like every day there's another young black male or even an old black male that is shot and killed by police officers who, you know, are sworn to serve and protect, I think. But when you are an African-American male, there seems to be this kind of more warrior purview, and that stems from stereotypes and cliches and the notion of what it is to be an African American male uh, in this culture and in this society. Um, and it's tough. It's tough even with two master's degrees, <laughs> and you know, working with students the way that I do and being on the faculty here. These things can be tough, and I wonder a lot of times what it's like to not bear that burden. You know, it's, it's still tough. And I, I think a lot, and I said this, actually I had to present to the faculty senate last week, um, based on some current events here uh, on campus, and I said, you know, I feel, again, this is so seminal in my house, you know, you can take the boy out of the hood. I said, but you can't take the hood out of the homeboy. Like, I still feel, you know, like I did when I was 16 and 17 and 18 years old. 
Um, so again, it really has um, kind of made this huge impact on my life. And I think it's opened up my eyes to really see people who are different from me. You know, I'm in Washington, D.C. This is an international city on many levels. Um, and if you've ever been made to feel other or different, um, I think it impacts you in such a way that it opens up your heart in a way where you are empathetic to people who are different from you. So, um, are there any other questions? Does anyone want to talk about their kind of, I'm curious to see how other people experience the film. Um, you mentioned the East Coast uh, view. I'm from the D.C. area. Okay. I really didn't know a lot about Southern California hood life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, when I thought of hood life and hood culture, you know, I, I thought about New York City and the sort of, or similar cities and that sort of concrete jungle. So when mm -hmm. I saw Boys in the Hood to see palm trees and sunshine, but to see all this poverty and angst, it mm -hmm. really had an impact on me. And I saw a world that I didn't know existed. And, and of course, around, like, I guess two, three years before that, with the explosion of gangster rap, mm -hmm. it right. was just this whole new world that my young eyes and ears had never experienced. Okay. And even with the music, right, we've all, we still, in the music, there's this kind of pitting, right, this kind of East Coast, West Coast war, which, right. you know, yeah. and so it's interesting that we see that kind of analog in both, and again, these kind of artistic builds. We see that in the film, and we see that in the music, again, many times that are kind of led by these rappers. I, I thought about Juice, Tupac Shakur, was in Juice, uh, directed by Ernest Dickerson, who was um, Spike Lee's longtime cinematographer. Yeah. Others, I'm curious about your experiences with the film. Well, I just have a question more about, so the, the film clearly resonates and has staying power, but do you think it's reflective of our modern situation? I know that there's some parallels with the fears of the Please. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also, we talk about the, the OED definition of urban, right. and the sort of not it. so coded language right. that politicians I want that on a t shirt. When they talk <laughs> about urban areas, right? But we also sort of have data that says urban crime isn't what it was. Right. Right? It, it, the inner city is not this dangerous place that we imagine it to be, and that have we let the boys in the hood depiction of urban life stay in the forefront of our imagination to the point where we don't see the cities for what they are right now. I think it's tough. I think that for whatever reasons, we look at black people in a monolithic way. Mm -hmm. And we don't like to kind of deviate from that. Um, you know, and I think even with my uh, academic success and my education that I am a little kind of resistant to kind of acclimate myself into this sense of America you know America hasn't you know treated African Americans kindly really you know historically um, and while I uh, graciously accept my kind of middle class <coughs> existence again I still kind of really identify with this and I think a lot of people do for better or worse yeah. look at black people again it's also a class issue through this lens of um, you know we can go back and look at uh, they call me Mr. Tibbs I mean we look at black people through this lens and a lot of it is kind of perpetuated through media and depictions right. of 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 black faces. Um, when I was in New Orleans, again, right after Katrina, I met, was at a bar, doing a happy hour, as I want to do, having a beer, and it was a guy who was a oil rig worker who lived in a city south of, uh, outside of Orleans Parish called, and this is great, cut off Louisiana. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, on a rig, like, seven days on, seven days, whatever, the whole thing. And, uh, and I was at the Bayou Beer Garden in my neighborhood, and we got to talk, and he was like, I don't know how you do it. I said, do what? How you live in New Orleans? And it was like, New Orleans was like this mythic, like crazy, concrete, crime-ridden jungle. And I think, and it's funny now because I live here, but as someone who has spent their entire life in California, I was like, why are, like, why are people really crack on California? <laughs> like, people really kind of knock, oh, it's stuff crazy and they put avocado and everything and they all do yoga and they go to farmer's <laughs> markets and they're kooky and they're all, you know, meditating or whatever. Um, and now that I've been gone for 
seven years. I'm like, oh, that's what they that's what they mean when they talk about California. I mean, there's been enough distance. Um, but I really do think it's this kind of this kind of idea of what it is to be. You know, a friend, a friend of mine who's from uh, Brooklyn, who was like, I went to California for like a weekend, like whatever, for a wedding, and it just was like, I mean, you don't see like Kim Kardashian walking around. Like, it's not. I don't know. Like, people have this idea of what like that is, but you know, my Los Angeles was a very kind of different, realized thing for me that wasn't necessarily Boys in the Hood, but it also wasn't Grand Canyon or Crash or fill in the blank. I mean, by the same token, I looked at shows like Seinfeld and Friends, having never been to New York, and I'm like, where are the black people? Like, there's no black people in New York? They don't have any black friends? And, and my cousin, who is in Atlanta now, uh, married her husband, who's from Queens, and the first time she went to New York to go visit his family, she was like, Derek, I haven't heard English in three days. <laughs> you know, but where's, where is that version of New York? So I, again, I think it's a lot of kind of what we see and what we don't see and how that necessarily lines up with the reality of it. I wanted to make a comment. I thought it was very sweet, the love story between Nia Long and... We forgot about Nia Long. Yes. How amazing is she? Yeah. Yes, indeed. And it was a very innocent, adolescent love relationship. Uh, very sweet. Right. And again, you know, we certainly have this notion of the kind of savage, swaggery, sexual black male in Trey is a virgin who lies about it and is upset by it. And, and, and Nia Long's character is this sweet Catholic girl. And they are having a tiff, you know, we kind of see this in Medean Rest of their talking about when are they, when is it going to happen? When are we going to do it? And, um, you know, and he at one point confesses to Ricky in the car, who is a father, a teenage father, um, that he hasn't quite gone all the way with Nia Long's character. So that, that it's, an interesting kind of, again, depiction of um, this kind of notion of the mandingo, you know, that we have. And then, you know, Trey, who's like, he says, I'm scared. That's why we have that, I'm scared. So, yes, that's, that is a great, a great kind of uh, sub, sub scene in the movie. Do you spend a lot of time with students mm -hmm. on campus? If, if the library were to show a series of these films and others that, that you might recommend to us. Mm -hmm. What would the students' reaction be? You know, I, 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 you know, I feel like all the students are 18 years old, and they have an 18-year-old kind of mindset. So I think in many a quarter respects, of them are <laughs> right. Yeah, I was going to say there's that. Uh, I guess that's accurate. But um, I'd like to think, you know, in kind of like you know, I my one of my mother's favorite movies was To Kill a Mockingbird which, you know, was black, black and white, it wasn't even color. Like, what, they didn't have color yet? What's going on? <laughs> um, you know, so if there, there are conceits, I think, that kind of date the film. Okay. But I think when you have a great story and a great storyteller, that you trust them and you go along that path with the story. So I think on a superficial level, they'll be like, well, how come they're talking on phones? and how come they're, I mean, there's like <laughs> those kinds of like technological <laughs> things, but I think that they can relate to the young man who was a little apprehensive about kind of going all the way with his girlfriend yeah. and dealing with, you know, this kind of tug of war between his father who was this kind of righteous man who wants to raise him to be a man and the, the pull of the lore of the fast money of the streets and um, you know, kind of finding an identity through that. So I think um, a good story cuts through all of that. Um, Do you know if any of these are used in classes? Even snippets of them? I the don't, and it's something I've talked a little bit about in SOC, maybe yeah. even thinking about maybe doing this as like an, an adjunct role, yeah. kind of talking about these films because you know, our, our student base here is increasingly diverse. And I think there's something to be said. I mean, and I can't be the only one that has, this movie has resonated with in such a capacity. So I think there, there's something to be said for that. But I think, I think it would be um, a good thing to do. Yeah, I'd, I'd be in full support of that. Okay. Yeah. And 
So even though you know there are parts of the film that are dated, um, I, I wish I had watched it before uh, coming here. But uh, one thing that I do remember um, and a theme that it was kind of shocking to see it then: um, black cops brutalizing black um, kids. Right. <laughs> because nowadays, you know, it's a lot of you know focus on white cops against black and brown people, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of black cops who are just as brutal as white cops. So that's something that really stuck out with me. And, you know, and when I was a kid, when I was growing up and when this movie was out, you know, that was like the biggest fear. I remember being, I remember I just got my driver's license and didn't have anything to do, but was happy to kind of flex my freedom as a licensed driver. <laughs> And just would pick up my friends and drive around and listen to music and we would go to the beach and we'd go eat tacos and we'd just kind of do our kind of San Diego thing. And I remember, and it happened so quickly, I remember we just, we're going back to the house. I, let me tell you, I had a 1985 Ford Escort. I was not falling out of control. And um, drove up to the driveway and my mother was running out of the house and she was in like, a house coat, and you know, she's like, she's turn him loose, turn him loose, and I'm like, what is she even talking about? And behind me are two police cars that have kind of swooped in behind me, and I don't, I, I mean, it really is a blur. I don't even know, and we weren't, you know, acting out, and we were good kids. Who I was a paper boy for five years. I knew everyone in my neighborhood. My father was in the navy. I certainly wasn't going to be a joker not with a Navy dad who'd been in Vietnam. Um, and again, and, and the interesting thing is that one of the cops was a guy who had been a security guard at my junior high. And so just when he saw it was me, it really kind of de-escalated, I mean, just as fast as it had happened. Tony Wong, that's his name, Tony Wong was a, a good guy. But I do remember it was like the worst thing that could happen to you was not just getting pulled over by a, a police officer, but by a black police officer who had a white partner. Because the idea was that the black police officer would go above and beyond as a, and would flex his authority as a cop, which superseded his blackness. So if this black cop would rough you up in front of this white partner, that would buy him some kind of merit or credence with fellow officers. And so that was something, and we, we do see that. In the so I do, again, you know, in my, in, and frankly, I was probably more afraid of my mother than police officers, but that's all right. Um, honestly, so, uh, but I, it was, and again, it, it happened so, and I don't remember any sirens, I don't remember any flashing lights. Did they ever tell you what you did? I don't even, re I don't remember. I, don't I just remember my mom coming out in like her house coat and like her hair covered up, turn him loose, turn him, and I, I don't even think I got out of the car. And then Tony, oh, oh, Derek, oh. And it was just as, just as quickly as it happened, had kind of de-escalated, but, and again, I'm pulling up in my parents' house who had bought that house 25 years ago. So, that happened, yeah. Others' thoughts and impressions of the film? Um, yeah, I was gonna say for for me, I, I, uh, coming from an education background, I think uh, so. Before I was even working in higher ed, I, I worked with a, a nonprofit where we we worked with kids in struggling schools and things mm -hmm. like that. And of course, our big message that we always preach was you know work hard, go to college, and mm -hmm. all these types of things. And uh, and actually, I can say like this movie is actually what what led me to to higher ed, mm. which, which was a a very interesting thing because. Uh, like the way the movie ends where it's like, you know, this person, you know, maybe this person died, this person went on about life, this person went to college. Uh, and I think something that really resonated was for, I guess for that moment, it was a happy ending. Mm -hmm. But then I, I think something that also resonated was like, well, it's, it's actually a beginning because it's like, you know, like what happened when they left this environment or, or say like when Trey left this environment because I think he went to college. Right. And so it's like, was he prepared for college? Did he get out in four right. years? Did he, uh, you know, was he prepared for life outside of this, I guess what they would say, inner city or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, outside of that? So I think that was just like a very interesting thing and it, uh, just, you know, from that sort of like what happens with life outside of this circle. You know, you know one of the things, um, and I was 
can't think of where I really read this, um, but it was talking about just kind of the experience of like African American males in the inner cities. Um, is that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I can really identify with that. Um, again, I'm you know with current news, I'm tired of turning on the news and seeing unarmed you know young black men that are killed by the police who. Well, he was reaching for this, and it turned out to be a wall. I mean, we can go back to Amadou Diallo mm -hmm. in 99, who was shot 41 times uh, by reaching for his wallet. Um, <clears throat> and those, again, those things make an impact. But, you know, we do, and it's a bittersweet ending, right? Because we see Trey going off to Morehouse, uh, Brandy down the street at Spellman, you know, but we also get the byline that Doughboy was killed two weeks later after he is responsible for the murder of his brother's killers. Um, and he says, even at the, the last five minutes of the film, like it just goes on and on and on. It just kind of repeats itself. You know, this cycle of, of brutality and murder and, um, and mayhem. And so, um, it's a, uh, it's certainly, again, it, it really resonated with me. Um, but it is interesting to think about where, where Trey and Brandy might be, you know, 25 years later. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. The other thing too is now thinking about that um, uh, Doughboy and um, Ricky's mother, like their mother, his mother, you know, mm -hmm. just lost both his children now. Right. So like, what's what's the future for her? What is she doing now? Right. That's kind of something that to think about as well. Like, what is going on with her now? Right. And she is left with Ricky's son, so she's a grandmother. But it's also another thing that's interesting in the film is to see her kind of the way she favors Ricky yeah. yes. in the film. You know, it's almost as if she's written Doughboy off. And what does that say, and how does that impact Doughboy? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that I, I was thinking about when I was watching it last night. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, at one point there's a recruiter from USC who comes to see Ricky's tape for uh, uh, football. And he says, bluntly, and it's funny, you know, my cousin, Marlon, was like a Ricky who played football. And that was like his family, like, kind of, rested their livelihood on the back of my cousin Marlon, who ended up breaking his leg. And so what do you do when you can't do the thing that you've done for 18 years anymore? And so the recruiter says at one point, you know, not everyone who comes to USC on the football scholarship makes it to the NFL. What are your options going to be? And, and, and Ricky uh, does say, you know, I, I really like computers. You know, do you think that I, I could be good at that? And the recruiter says, really kind of sweetly, I think that you can do anything that you put your mind to, which I thought was a nice little kind of tender moment, um, especially amongst two black men uh, in this film that is um, in many ways honestly brutal. So, others' impressions of the film? I'm making sure that I've gone over kind of everything in my notes, the mythic inner city, soundtracks. Um, I wrote down Lean On Me for some reason. I can't, I don't know if that's a hood film. The movie now? Yeah, the movie. It's not really. It's mostly in class. I it's in class and it's, um, you know, the inimitable. Yeah. Walking. It was pretty great. Um, another thing I think is really interesting too is, you know, we see, you know, we know Ice Cube from in WA in his own kind of solo career. But that four years later, he writes the script for the movie Friday, which is interesting because if you take Boys in the Hood on the kind of head side of the coin and you put Friday on the tail side, like that really is Derek Jefferson's life. Like it's so, <laughs> like, my now goodness. We have to see <laughs> it's something else to kind of. You know, and I don't, I don't, it's something I had, I don't know if I was in, I guess I was in college at the time, and I just didn't, you know, I was already seeing, yeah, at this point I'm seeing, like, you know, The Seventh Seal, and all these kind of, like, French New Wave films that really kind of broaden my horizons, and maybe I thought I was too good for kind of hood films, but when I finally <laughs> went back and revisited Friday, like on videotape, remember those, um, I was like, oh my god, like, this is really, like, the funny kind of flip side of Boys in the Hood. Um, yeah, no, that was that was something else. So that makes a good double feature. It kind of lightens the load a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nia Long. 
She was something else. She's yeah. great. Regina King as well. Mm -hmm. Regina King. Yeah. And you know, another thing I thought about too as I was looking at my notes is that this is pre Rodney King LA. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so that's I mean historically, like there's a it's a it's a lot going on in LA at this time. Right. Like you know, the riots would be the following summer. Right. Okay. Um, Another, I don't know if I would necessarily classify this as a hood film. It's a film that kind of incorporates gang elements as colors. Yeah. With uh, Robert Duvall and Sean Penn as like the police the, officers. It's like the side of. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting. But I remember Ice T being on the soundtrack because it was always about the soundtrack for me as an <laughs> avid record collector. Um, you know, I also looked at this, I mean, this kind of East Coast, West Coast thing, looked at like this kind of, you know, and in that way, it gets a lot of light about their lyrical content and their misogyny and, and, and rightly so um, but they really were these kind of like analogs for stuff that I was seeing and others experienced um, on the flip side you know, I certainly being, remember being huge fans of Public Enemy so we saw that on the kind of East Coast kind of variant of that um, for me it's almost always about the music and so I, I do think about how these things kind of like parallel I see certainly kind of Public Enemy was uh, the lead single on the Do The Right Thing soundtrack. Um, so there's that as well. Um, and another thing, you know, and, and, and growing up, you know, I, I keep thinking about the notion of fatherhood, and I wasn't particularly close to my dad growing up. We're certainly much closer now, um, but there's a lot of Furious <laughs> Styles in Mr. Jefferson. There's a lot, you know, there, the, when he comes home, when he moves, in with his dad, he, the first thing he says is have him rake up the rake up the yard. And I, I could go home right now, my father would be like, rake up the yard, <laughs> cut the grass, you know, take this trash out. And I'm 43 years old. <laughs> so there's 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 that as well. Um, I don't know, it's, it's certainly, it's worth a revisit if you haven't seen it in a while. And I had to like, I just assumed it was gonna be on Netflix and it wasn't on Netflix. Um, I will say the library has a DVD copy that's available for checkout. <laughs> um, yeah, it's certainly it's certainly worth a revisit. It really set the tone, um, you know, for a lot of movies to come. But it really was this kind of seminal film in that capacity. Now it's always going to hold a kind of special place in my heart. I think. Another comment, an observation that struck me mm -hmm. was the uh, the young boy who was Doughboy's friend who was in a wheelchair Chris. and always sucking on a pacifier. Mm -hmm. What does that say? It was just that his relationship, how he suffered and was in a wheelchair after, I assumed it was after a shooting. Right, and it's never addressed and, in the film. And the, the need to suck on a pacifier of this not really... Um, not having enough nurturing or whatever mm. it symbolized, but it was a, it was a very interesting character in the group of Doughboy's friends. Right. Yeah. Um, and another thing that was kind of sad as I started kind of preparing for this is start kind of doing the like, where are they now? And you know, certainly we know where Neil Long and Larry Fishburne, etc., are, but you know. The guy that played, I think his name is Dookie in the character, has died. Uh, the guy who actually shot Ricky in the film was killed in prison. Um, so it's interesting to see that how these things kind of parallel and mirror real life. You know, just because you've been in a film, in a major film, just because you've had this visibility doesn't mean that you're exempt um, from the crazy wackiness of black on black crime. Mm -hmm. Even more protected in some instances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the thing got right. And it's just enough to like either make people jealous or assume that you are a billionaire because you had a bit part in the film. Um, yeah, you, you certainly, I, I, you know, when I go home, you know, again, I lived in this kind of working class, middle class family, and, you know, the kind of, uh, guys that ended up living a kind of different life than me assume that I am like, you know, something, I'm like, I'm a librarian. <laughs> I work at a university and I'm certainly not, you don't know what we make in higher ed. Do not assume, um, you know, that I have a row house in DuPont Circle. I absolutely do not. Um, 
but it's um, it's something else. It's kind of perception of what it is. Well, if you got out of the hood and you went to college and then you went to graduate school and then you went to graduate school again, then you must be, you know, Henry Louis Gates Jr. I guess. <laughs> nah, sure he's certainly nice. I'd have a beer with him. So, any other questions or thoughts on the film? You may have addressed it earlier, but how did your friends um, feel about the movie? That you all like oh my it. goodness! It was like we loved it because we saw ourselves. You know, we saw ourselves, and again, and I think that we felt that initially. I talked about um, seeing do the right thing when I was sixteen, and coming out of that film and feeling just mad as hell, and then seeing this because it was like like we knew people who had lowriders, and we knew people that had Jerry curls, and we knew Aisha, and we knew Doughboys and Rickies and Trays, and so it was a, a mirror that we kind of hold up to ourselves. And so it kind of really, I think, kind of gave us some kind of validation that we weren't just marks. We weren't just kind of these people aimlessly kind of going through life. We saw representations of ourselves that were accurate and gave us kind of something to kind of hold on to and give us some kind of visibility. I, th I think that's huge. There's something to be said, I think, for when you see people that look like you, that makes a, a, a huge difference. And I certainly think about that just in my work in the library, you know, absolutely, as we continue to diversify our user base. Anything else? Well, I appreciate everyone coming out. And